Jasper, is that we is that people kind of wonder sometimes how come seltzer is a meme now like how come Lacroix is a meme oh we, Lacroix especially yeah. exactly and the reason is because uh it what happened is is that millennials turned 30 and they couldn't drink soda anymore ah yes because they didn't want to die of diabetes yes. and so they had to switch but they still wanted the carbonation because yeah. we all love the carbonation yeah and so they had to convince themselves that this awful alternative to soda, <laughs> uh, this soul-crushing nothing, uh, is actually cool right, and, right. and fun. And so they had to meme it up. Yeah. And so they had to create a whole cult- online culture around uh, seltzer in order to justify to themselves why they're right. drinking this clearly inferior thing to what they want to be drinking. Yes. And it does not involve them just being old, <laughs> right. which they can't <laughs> accept. Well, it's funny because you mentioned LaCroix specifically. Like, it's a little different in New York because we've had seltzer. Like, it's like Oh, that's there, true. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and the LaCroix thing kind of threw me for a loop. But with the branding thing, you're right. Everything is kind of like those jewel, like, mango colors. Yeah. You know, it's got, like, that nice uh, look to it. It's, it's all fancy and shit. Yeah. Um, but there's absolutely no difference whatsoever between that and like fucking um schweppes yeah but uh you know the kids love it they, they totally do. love it yeah they um, it's like I, i'm waiting for a Lacroix flavored vape that's the next <laughs> step you get a little pop in there yeah um it's funny because uh i think the other thing about seltzer and this is quite the tangent but um for me when i when i i've been i've drink, drank it since i was a kid but similar to like um i don't know like espresso mm-hmm. or nicotine seltzer does give you this sort of bite yeah. You know, so like you feel like you really are drinking something. Mm-hmm. And no, I've got like I never like seltzer and I still, although I should stop, I still drink soda because, you know, it, it tastes good. Fuck you. Uh, Best thing for a hangover. Da- <laughs> exactly. Oh, a fountain a, Coke. Oh, my God. It's like it's magic. It is. It works uh, out every time. Yeah. And uh, it's like, all right, we're going to die anyway. Who cares? Shut up. Uh, <laughs> but I, I do like try to, you know, even it out by, by replacing right. sodas. Yeah, servings with it and that has given me this thing of like yeah i can't drink plain water now <laughs> water that doesn't have bubbles in it well, this is disgusting yeah to me. seriously get this out of my face <laughs> it's not well branded yeah you know, it's it's, just... it doesn't have that it doesn't have a kick it's just it's as drill says uh, it tastes like nothing <laughs> it. <laughs> it's like diner <laughs> Communist greetings, friends. This is Sean KB with another installment of Antifada's History is a Weapon. Thank you for everybody who's listening to this right now. Behind the paywall, I am here back with the man himself, Matt Crispin. What's up, Matt? Hey, how you doing? I'm excellent, man. Um, I needed uh, a wingman again on this one. I needed somebody who not only had the historical chops... But the mental perversity hmm. to be able to go deep, yeah. deep into the cellar, into the swamp, into the catacombs, if you will, yes. of uh, disgustingly racist, fascist French literature. And uh, who better than uh, than you to, to jump into the breach once more? Yeah, reading terrible shit is sort of my job, so uh, I'm ready. I was ready to do it. <laughs> now, when we spoke about this, the first thing I asked you was, I'm reading... The Camp of the Saints by Jean Raspel, the topic of today's episode. Have you ever read the Turner Diaries? And the answer was, of course. Oh, yes. Of course I've read the Turner Diaries. Uh, I read that in high school, I believe. I um, think I did, too. Yeah. Uh, I hadn't read Camp of the Saints. I'd heard about it, of course, because it was famously Steve Bannon's favorite book. Right. And that's when it came back into people's consciousness. Uh, and th- thanks to your suggestion for the episode, I was able to take a look at it and uh, it's it's a fascinating read, that's for sure, and uh, and a very interesting contrast to Turner Diaries. Yes, indeed. you really do see the you know Euro Nazis are from Mars, American Nazis are from <laughs> Venus. <laughs> contrast between the two works, a hundred percent. Yeah, um, we're the reason why I think to the the Turner Diaries uh, Camp of Saints comparison is important is because you know. Raspel does this work of art, and who is that asshole that wrote the Turner Diaries? I forget. He was some uh, his, national... name was, his name, uh, I think his real name was William Pierce. He wrote right. under a pseudonym. Uh, Aryan Nations? Yeah, or yeah. Something Aryan Nations like founder, yeah. yeah. Um, so back in the 90s, for people that remember that, or you've probably heard of it, even if you don't, uh, 
Portions of the Turner Diary, several pages of it, were found with a man named Tim McVeigh when he was arrested after he blew up a government building in Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. Uh, People might remember that or have seen the pictures of it. Um, In fact, part of his plot with him and his co-conspirators, these right-wing racist militia types, was inspired directly by these Turner Diaries. Uh, So... Similar to back then in the 90s, uh, Camp of the Saints today, as Matt said, uh, is a favorite of Steve Bannon's. It is a book that a uh, politician named Marine Le Pen has a signed copy of sitting directly on her desk at all times. Yeah, it is a book that came out in 1973, but is now being called prophetic. It's been uh, republished in France uh, and in English, in England uh, and America in English. And um, it is kind of this resurgent, um, it's a throwback, but there's something about this book at this moment in time that are getting the right wing excited in a similar way uh, that they were excited about the Turner Diaries in the 1990s. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and it really does show the the changing face, I guess, of 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 neo reaction whatever you want to call it the way that uh the way that people's in america anyway that their their attitude has changed uh because the thing about americans is sort of the defining characteristic uh, my co-host on chapo felix has talked about this a lot is their pathological optimism mm, and mm. how that inf- in, that uh, structures so many elements of american culture and of course that's part and parcel of what we talked about on our previous show about that right. expanding frontier, that free real estate, yes. as Tim Heidecker would say, that gave everybody a chance to start fresh basically at will. And that gives Americans this very unique world historical <laughs> uh, m- insane optimism. Right. And Almost grounded in the soil in a sense. Exactly. And the Turner Diaries is very much an American work in that it is a book about a triumph. Uh, Earl Turner, the, 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 the guy who writes the diaries, a fictional character, is writing in a world where... Uh, racial cells are awakening to do terrorism, like bombing American uh, military installations and uh, government buildings mm-hmm. as a terrorist network to try to awaken the white race. Um, and his last act uh, is to crash a plane into the FBI headquarters, killing himself uh, in a it's sort of a in a nine eleven. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it does. Uh, it it. It's prophetic about nine eleven, at least. Right, uh, and I think he had a nuke as well. Right? Yes, like they're going to nuke the F- the DC and the FBI yeah. headquarters. But there is a framing device, kind of like a, a, a bo- another book written in a similar era, a, a Handmaid's Tale, mm-hmm. uh, in which it's contextualized that this is a historical document f- uh, in a war- in an America in the future where the white race has triumphed. Right, where all the other races, including Israel, have been wiped off the map. And there is a pure, hygienic, white world. And this book is, and his, his diaries are a journal of, of martyrdom, but in the service of victory, ultimate victory. 100%. And it's fascinating, too, because, um, you know, it, it is a highly racist book. It's almost, it's more brutally racialized, I think, even than Camp of Saints. And that says a lot because Camp of Saints, uh, we'll get into this, um, it has the most brute and I think uh, dehumanizing and disgusting uh, sort of um, uh, descriptions of uh, brown people and uh, immigrants and whatnot. But uh, in the Turner Diaries, you know, um, it's very much like you could imagine the, the Earl Turner, the uh, the hero being played by Bruce Willis. Yeah, right. It's this it's this action packed, poorly written, but very action packed. And I think that's uh, where the brutality comes from. Is yeah. that as as awful as the images that Raspail brings up, he is writing in a very ele- you know faux elevated. Uh, it, it's based the, the the two books. It's the difference between a dumb high school student and a very pretentious one. Right. You know, like the the kid in the back of the class who's huffs glue versus the kid who has a suit a briefcase that he brings and is literally in the French Academy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it, right, r- there is a space for Raspal in the highest arts and yeah. letters of French society. Yeah. I mean, it's got it has it has literary quality, which which Turner Diaries absolutely does not. Turner no, Diaries is written and honestly, given its its. Its stated goal of trying to, you know, uh, engage people, uh, you know, the white lumpen American. Uh, that's a smart move to mm. not make it too fancy right. pants. Uh, so that means it does read more brutally because they just use slurs. You know, right, they just right. say the worst words because why would you want to spend a paragraph, you know, uh, artfully describing the the grotesque non humanity of of these people when you could just use a nice 
N word or something. Right, right. Pl- uh, plenty of those. Another, sure. another, another element of it's very American. You know, don't give me the the bow art nonsense. Just give me a nice, uh, a nice uh, st- steel glass tower. It could be like uh, those Left Behind uh, novels that came out mm-hmm. that are, are very much yeah. popular among the uh, Christian fundamentalists, which are also complete trash in terms of literary style. But it gets the point across. Yeah. It's this action thriller. But you pointed to the, I think the important thing, the important difference. And I think that, you know, they're both written in the 70s. So we're going to tease this out by looking at French history. The difference between the optimism Mm -hmm. of that Turner Diaries and the deep, dark pessimism of uh, Raspel's uh, Camp of Saints. I don't think it's merely just that uh, it's uh, one was American and this one is French because Raspel's Camp of the Saints is now popular among the alt right now in the United States. So in a sense, it seems like these conceptions of the white future or the white race or dystopia or utopia have kind of gone from one shore to the other. They've gone across the pond and it's resonating for people in the United States like something that the Turner Diaries would have back then. But it's, uh, again, like a French artifact and very, very, very um, uh, pessimistic, I think, about uh, how that how that white race is going to do. Yeah. Now, that is the big difference, and, and what is interesting uh, is the degree to which, as you say, uh, that that element has infiltrated the normally pathologically optimistic American psyche, uh, and I think that does speak to the changing world that people find themselves in. The, the, you know, we, I mean, in the 90s, you had, you'd had maybe 10 years of really hyperdrive neoliberal capitalism, atomizing uh, societies and, and, and undermining communities. Add another 25 years to that, and the prospects look even worse, especially as uh, one element that is in Camp of the Saints and is not in um, Turner Diaries, which is this migration yes, idea, this yes. idea of, 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 of invasion, becomes much more, is much more salient now in the minds of, uh, of the, the nationalistic right than it was in the 90s. There, Bef- bef- like because because it was really NAFTA that supercharged Mexican immigration to the United States, and that had barely happened when uh, when um, Turner Diaries was popular. Yeah, and uh, of course the other huge factor is that um, there was uh, that nine eleven that we spoke about before. Yes, of course, nine really, eleven is huge. Really scrambles the uh, the American psyche in a lot of ways. Um, so. This book that we're speaking about uh, has been translated into 14 languages, uh, has sold a half million units in France since it's been uh, republished. Uh, not just Steve Bannon and Steve King, of course, of course. Are, are fans of this, uh, but the National Review has given it favorable uh Ratings uh, and also um, the Atlantic Monthly, believe it or not, <laughs> those do paragons of, uh, you of know centrism. What? I do believe it. They say, while readers might find Raspel's vision uncomfortable and his lang- language vis- uh, vicious and repulsive, he may have been onto something. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like the, the the let's let's go through the plot of the book. And one thing that resonates is about you said invasion, yes. right? Uh, something that's been happening over the last several years is a exodus of people out of war-torn regions in MENA, right? Yeah. The Middle East and North Africa. I think in 2016, uh, 2,500 people died trying to take a boat from uh, North Africa uh, to Italy to try to get into Europe. And then mm-hmm. I think in, 19, in uh, 2017, over 5,000 people were drowned mm-hmm. uh, in, in boats uh, just trying to make it, make it as refugees uh, into the West. Now... This might be another reason why people are calling it prophetic in a very kind of base way, because that is what Respel's um, essential uh, plot point is in this book. Uh, you've gotten to the point now, and he writes this in 73, but it's in some vague sort of future, probably like around now-ish, uh, where so the first world continues to have a pretty high quality of life. But um, the kind of population bomb 1970s conception of like these uh, breeding, this exponential growth of the third world populations uh, has reached the point where there's mass starvation, where there's famines in places like India and Africa and elsewhere. And right in the beginning of the book, it starts in Calcutta. And you have a group of um, Indians. uh, He uses the word Hindus a lot, right? Who decide that. They are sick of piecemeal coming to the paradise, right? The chosen land of the West. And they are going to basically take over and invade a hundred ships 
and one million of them are going to get on these rickety ships and they're going to make their way all the way around the Cape of Good Hope yep. and make their ways onto the shores of Europe and indeed onto the shores of France. And this is sort of the, um, the device that he uses is this sort of impending doom, you know, as these one million unassimilatable brown people slowly make their way towards the cradle of Western civilization. Yeah. Uh, it, and of course, it's not, it's, it's partially their thought, but it's also largely the, th- the uh, responsibility of self-hating Westerners, yes. Yes. Uh, decadent, postmodern, uh, perverted, deracinated Westerners who no longer have any conviction in the culture that brought them up, uh, have nothing but contempt for it, in fact, and have a sort of a thanatoptic desire to see it destroyed and use uh, these, this undifferentiated horde as sort of the instrument of their of their own the, like the cultural suicide right right uh this is like that um that great replacement or white genocide thing that uh wasn't it laura southern that actually went out on the fucking mediterranean in a she boat to, try to stop the she fucking, tried to oh stop them God. from rescuing people on the mediterranean <sighs> She was firing flares at uh, at refugee boats. These fucking monsters. Yeah. So yeah, there's um there's not just the outside, the third world coming towards the first world, uh, but there is also, as you said, this deep corruption uh, within Western civilization, as as he sees it. Right. Uh, people are corrupted by drugs. People are corrupted by free sex. People are corrupted by Marxism. People are corrupted by miscegenation. You know, people are corrupted by all these different things. And most importantly, too, for Raspal, who is something we don't have in the United States, uh, who is a integralist uh, Catholic monarchist yeah. to this day. Right. Yeah. Even the Catholic Church, there's a, a supposed Vatican three that happens <laughs> where the Catholic Church essentially abrogates all responsibility to Christianity and becomes like a uh, liberation theology Marxist uh, group right. that uh, wants the West to be destroyed, that wants um, you know, the decline and the, the destruction of all the things that Raspel and others hold dear. So, yes, it's very much about this kind of internal, internal rot. Um, let me say this, too. I'm not one. I'm not big on trigger warnings. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, I think uh, whether you're listening to the Antifada or Chapo Trap House, you kind of know what you're getting yourselves into. But that said, uh, if you are at all squeamish about uh, overt racism, uh, sexual assault, uh, brutal, horrific violence and things of that sort. It might be a good time to kind of, I don't know, turn it off. Or if the kids are in the room, maybe put them <laughs> to bed because uh, this is some deep, deep, dark shit that we're, uh, we're oh, about yeah. to get in right here. So um, that's pretty much like the outlines of the book. And as Matt said, it's very much this conception that the West has lost the nerve to even be able to carry on uh, such as what to, to, to bear this, this cradle of civilization any longer. Um, the... <laughs> This is so disgusting. But the chief, I guess, um, decision that France and the rest of the Western world uh, has to decide is whether when these one million migrants are coming to the United States, men, women and children, whether or not to fucking genocide them. Yeah. Over and over again, they have opportunities to genocide these million people. And Raspel goes, he pretty much says blatantly that if at any time, even by an act of God, if there had been a storm to sink these ships, right, it could have been stopped. The end of Western civilization could have been stopped. They had their chance to just completely to, to torpedo and murk all these people. Yeah. But nobody in France or any of the other countries just had the guts, the right. gall to open fire on men, women, and children. Because they have had their critical senses their faculties dulled by propaganda because a big element in the thing is about how the church and culture at large had preached this false egalitarianism that says that we are all brothers we are all equal and therefore none is above another and if someone is coming to your doorstep seeking help that you are morally responsible to give provide it for them and that that was what stops them because the interesting thing about this is that there's no force in, uh, uh, on the part of the refugees. There's no, they never use violence. Exactly. And the fact that they don't use violence is what, under, what disarms the West, literally disarms yes. them. Yes. Because they have been inoculate, they've been indoctrinated into a mindset that says that if someone doesn't raise a hand to you, then they, therefore you have no right to, to uh, raise a hand to them, even if their mere existence is going to destroy everything that you hold dear. Uh, and he very explicitly says that that is a 
a a folly and and doom for civilization if it is allowed to uh go along and it also goes back towards this idea he has that this is all a self-inflicted thing yes because if the tide of immigrants coming had any kind of plan hostility agency of, of like a military arm then it would be a battle between sides uh and to a person like Raspell, the West will always win that due to their innate superiority. Right. They, the, over and over again, he stresses that these people are not human in the way that Westerners are. In in such incredible detail. Horrifying. Oh, my God. He goes out of it. I mean, the enti- every scene involving the, the, the boats or, or in India is meant to convey that this is a... He calls it the beast oft, right. yeah. often. Yep. And the and monster. It, and the monster. Yeah. It, is, it is an undifferentiated mass. It's a, it's a natural... It's just a... It is, it is a force without any kind of central nervous system. And it could never beat the West because the West is inherently superior. And it, if they... Yeah, if they just sent some fucking F... Uh, or some B-20... B-52s to just drop some bombs on the, on the, uh, on the boats, they would have been fine. The reason that they stopped themselves from doing that because they've been brainwashed into thinking that nonviolence is virtue, regard, regardless of the context, and and that's the essential, uh, and it and it, it and that uh, that view of it, where it's entirely self-inflicted. There's no outside force that can undermine Western civilization. That really does speak to Raspail's position as this ultra monarchist uh, Frenchman, because uh, for guys like that. The primal scene is the French Revolution. Yes, and if you believed in the society of orders that pre- that uh, pervaded before the French Revolution, the 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 serfs, the peasants, the you know the third estate, they could never take power because by virtue of the fact that they're the third estate, right? Like the orders exist to express a natural uh, a natural hierarchy, right? An uh, organic society, an, exactly yeah. an organic structure. So the only way that they could have won, and this and this was the diagnosis of every of all the reactionaries who came right after the French Revolution and analyzed it, like Edmund Burke and De Maistre, was that the fault was with the French ruling class, exactly with the monarchy, with the with the first uh, the second estate. They didn't have it within them to stop this, uh, and that's because they had become decadent, and that's because they had lost their drive. And, and their confidence in themselves. And, and I think decadent is the perfect word for what uh, Raspel is trying to, to point out here. I, too, was thrown by, you know, again, a book written in 73. So you have liberation struggles going on yeah. you know, all over the world. And yet, as you said, this, um, undisag- this uh, undisaggregated uh, mass of, uh, of third world peoples is, uh, is completely apolitical. Yeah. Right. There's absolutely no politics. There's almost like this zombie like uh, just spontaneous eat. movement yeah, yeah. to get to the promised land. They want to live in the in the land of uh, of milk and honey. And I think you're right that there, there's something it, it threw me that it wasn't political. But then I realized, too, about, uh, you know, there's the, the moment of nonviolence, you know, Gandhi and, and Martin Luther King. And with his very Catholic sensibility, I think you're right. He saw there's only one way. Right. That, that we could be defeated we and that was by defeating ourselves by yes. not having the guts to actually go through it yeah. so you touched on a few things um in french history that i think are very important for understanding uh what how a, how the hell a book like this could have got written and why the fuck people are reading this fucking trash today um he said raspel said in an interview that i uh, had the misfortune of watching it was from several years back it was on french television that his book was prophetic. He was writing what he saw. One day he was actually on the Côte d'Azur uh, in southern France, and he was at a, a house very much like the one described in the book, and he looked across the Mediterranean, and he thought, what if they came? <laughs> and in this interview he says, well, they finally come. Uh, and when the guy, when the interviewer asked him straight up, uh, you know, like, is this a racist book? Do you hate, you know, immigrants, this, that, and the other thing? Raspel said that the point of his book was to defend, to save indeed, 18 centuries of white Catholic French civilization. Those are the stakes for Raspel and the, and the new right uh, in France and elsewhere, right? It's about saving something called Western civilization. So that's something we need to interrogate through French history, right? Yeah. This conception of, of what is a civilization. It's like you can't put your finger on a civilization. It's like the state, right? Like mm-hmm. you can't touch the state. You know it exists, but it is an abstraction, although it has powers not only over us, 
you know, but also powers to compel us and impel us to do certain things. A state or a civilization is something that's invisible, but something that your grandparents might have died, of, died for in a war that you would do so today for people who aren't even born yet in the future. Right. This kind of real abstraction that, that one's trying to defend. So I think with all that being said, let's get into French history, how this fucked up French political ideology, uh, all of them actually, because France is completely different, I think, in terms of left, center, and right than uh, the United States and elsewhere. And let's kind of drum down where this book comes from and why it might be meaningful for folks uh, today who are unrepentant racist swine. Hmm. All right. So Matt Christman and I are history professionals. By that, I mean uh, amateurs who know a good amount of stuff. Uh, so we know that there, it's important to periodize. Uh, when Raspel says he's trying to save 18 centuries of uh, French civilization, we know not to go back 1,800 years and do all the fucking history. Uh, in fact, we're mostly going to be talking about what Matt mentioned with the ancient regime and the French Revolution and these Enlightenment ideas that come after. But right off the bat, I do think it's important to go back uh, to this sense of continuity that... Um, you know, ideologues of uh, French nationalism, uh, of whatever uh, shape or form they choose, uh, are hearkening back to, right? Mm -hmm. So the Franks, right, where the term French comes from, uh, Germanic tribe, actually warring amongst themselves, uh, kicked out of the area that they were living in uh, by the Rhine by other Germanic tribes, people of their own linguistic and racial group. They didn't want to live with the, uh, next to those people because they were fighting. And uh, they end up eventually taking over the Roman province of Gaul and uh, mixing with the um, Celtic or Gallic people that live there and displacing the Romans as the ruling class, essentially, uh, within what is now known as France. Um, they take up, uh, you know, Roman laws. They convert to Catholicism. But, um, but basically, they become a feudal society. It's impossible to understand the French in the same way that we would now as a nation state that has a, a civic ideology and that is uh, eth ethnically homogenous uh, and everything like that. You know, a civilization is supposed to be a culture or a language or a way of life, right? I don't see any way, I don't think you do either, that there could be any continuity b between then and now. No, I mean, if, if, if you, it depends, you know, the metric is what matters. If you're talking, one of the most popular ones and the one that, the one that, I think 19th century Europe largely uh, settled on as sort of a defining feature of, of a nation uh, was language. Right. And there was no French national language until well into the 19th century. The 19th century, yeah. folks. Um, yeah, I was actually in, in the course of, of reading about this, uh, a little fun fact here. I think it was uh, Pierre Bourdieu I found this from. But when you talk about you know, even more modern history, uh, they estimate that at the time of the French Revolution – only 50% of the people in France could even understand a lick of French, right? The official language of France. And only between 12 and 15% of the people actually spoke it, you know, as their first language. You had this mix of, um, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, people who spoke Provençal, mm -hmm. people who broke Bre spoke Breton, which was a Celtic language. People who spoke, um, what's Occitan is another one. Obviously, for, um, German speakers. Germans right? and Alsace-Lorraine. Right, yeah. and, and uh, Basque, of course, that and bizarre... Basque, yes. um, uh, isolate that language isolate there yeah. um, so really again like even that linguistic conception breaks down when you think about that and then I think too the racial one is is problematized too when I said that there were these warring Germanic tribes there's this I, I was reading Pinker the other day you know that you know Stephen Pinker. Oh yeah, uh, I think if uh, that famous Frenchman Voltaire was around today. Oh yeah, he's uh, Dr. Pangloss. The, yeah, he sure. is exactly. Uh, Pinker is Pangloss, and he wanted to do a uh, a sort of uh, evolutionary psych take on uh, racism that you know we came out of the savannah being afraid being xenophobic being afraid of the other and that you know people of different linguistic groups or different colors uh different religions right cannot live against you know amongst one another but then you look at again french history and you had a multilingual series of uh kingdoms uh, and empires right you had at a certain point in time the vikings were coming down and just fucking them up and stealing all their shit and plundering them so then a bunch of fucking scandinavians come down and take over all of fucking normandy yeah. right you had uh you know the, the 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 great state of that time was the holy roman empire which was this polyglot you know uh just amalgamation of different peoples simply because one habsburg married some hanover 
over in, who married this, that, and the other thing. Yeah. It's important, I think, for folks to know that this modern conception of the state is very much tied in with the modern production of the state. And the French Revolution uh, certainly is, uh, is the moment in time where that sort of sense of republicanism and, 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 and civics uh, starts to arise. So, Matt... You said earlier the ancient regime, right? That feudal aristocratic regime. Yes. Uh, monarchists like Respel and others, uh, there's Legitimist, there's Orleanist, there's Bonapartists in France. I know this is fucking crazy, but there's different factions of monarchists who compete about what fucking king they want to bring back at this given time, right? But uh, you, you had this, this feudal aristocratic system, and then this wonderful, glorious thing happens with the French Revolution. Do you want to talk a little bit about the sort of contradictions and the rot uh, of the ancient regime and, and what the French Revolution comes comes out of. Yeah, uh, I mean, by by the time of the French Revolution, the the French state was basically paralyzed. It, it could not function because uh, after the consolidation of power under the auspices of the king by Louis the Fourteenth, the Sun King, who famously said, "I am the state," and brilliantly was able to uh, bring most of the power uh, in France under control of him, as opposed to the the uh, aristocracy because that's the thing to remember about uh, about feudal societies is that they were never absolutist they were always this very tense uh, negotiation between the central authority of the king or prince or whoever and the feudal lords uh, the, 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 there was never uh, you could never just to tell if you were the king you could never just tell your lords to do something it would always had to be negotiated and that's why the first parliaments came into being the estates general in france parliament in england they they were to, neg- to they were to be the places where these negotiations took place right but uh, and uh louis the 14th did a good job of bringing control to himself one of the big things he did was build versailles mm. and basically make all of the biggest aristocrats spend themselves in a penury by living there with him come into our of, big poly house and spend all your money yeah and, exactly uh, yeah. just a big cuddle puddle <laughs> right. um, but then his son uh, uh or his uh, his successor uh louis the 15th and then of course louis the 16th not so good no. at doing that and by the time of the french revolution the centrifugal forces were going in the other direction they were pulling towards uh the local uh uh, authorities and so when louis tried to raise the money to get the state out of its incredible debt that it had accrued partially by funding the united states uh, <laughs> in its rebellion against the great britain oops uh, <laughs> uh yeah no good deed goes unpunished as they oh. say maybe they're paying us back with respel yeah you know? <laughs> seriously um so when louis was forced to call the estates general all of these forces all of this stagnation because uh the, the state had ceased to be functional. It still operated with with feudal um, feudal rules and, and laws that no longer had, bore any relationship to an emerging modern state. Uh, a, a friend of mine once pointed out that there were uh, by at the eve of the revolution there were contracts where where uh, feudal peasants uh, were obligated to pay a grain uh, a tithe to to the local uh, manor lord for use of a mill that had stopped it functioning hundreds of years previously just it just it's in the books and you have to do right, it right, right, right. Uh, and there's no mechanism for for modernizing anything there's a sclerotic system yeah. that's based on salic law and traditions that go back farther and farther and of course there is within this uh very ossified sort of political and social system a new class arising in the interstitials yes. where it becomes more and more powerful that would never let a mill sit there for no. hundreds of years there's, that's money you're, that's, you're <laughs> yeah. leaving money on the table it's gotta move it's gotta be liquid you yes. gotta fucking uh, have some production process and that's where and, uh, that's why when they sh- bring on the estates general uh it'll been one thing if it was just a classic battle between uh, the the aristocrats and the king mm-hmm. we've seen that forever we saw yeah. how that plays out and we talked about the peasant revolts even before. absolutely and also, how they yeah. figure into this organic ebb and flow you know it, it really was this dynamic um, homeostasis exactly but then there is by the by the the calling of the of the uh, states general uh by Louis the Sixteenth, there's a new group. It's it's technically just part of the Third Estate, along with everyone else who wasn't an aristocrat or a, or a, uh, a member of the clergy, but was different in that it was representative of a new dynamic face uh, of a emerging, nascent but clearly ex- uh, uh, in- incipient mm-hmm. capitalism, mm-hmm. the bourgeois. Yes, mostly lawyers, which is why I always think it's funny when people try to argue that the you can't analyze the French Revolution through the class lens because most of the members 
of, of the revolutionary class were not merchants. They were lawyers. And it's like, <laughs> dude, the, the, the legal profession is the, was the handmaiden of capitalism. Right. <laughs> it's like if you're abandoning feudal obligations and you're replacing them with interpersonal you know, uh, business transactions. And con- contracts. And yeah. contracts. Yeah. I mean, it's not like they didn't have tons of you know, legal imbroglio during the feudal era, but, but uh, yeah, creating contractual relationships exponentially increases the need for legal uh, representation. Right. And also at the same time, too, and, and this, is, this is where ideas, of course, get tied into history, and you know, it's a huge, <laughs> I don't know, debate and discussion about you know, how uh, uh, production and social life leads to ideas. But at the same time as all this is happening, uh, that nascent bourgeois class and uh, thinkers around uh, Europe and in France you know, are coming to these ideas of the Enlightenment, um, ideas that say essentially that this old order is corrupted and that, um, you know, uh, man is born free but is everywhere in chains. And um, these lawyers, you know, these then this incipient uh, bourgeoisie very much had a strong uh, ideological backbone in the sorts of very progressive uh, political ideologies and economic ideologies that are coming out of that with folks like Locke, uh, with folks like uh, Rousseau, you know. So there was also at at the same time as there was this social rot that's happening, you've got this kind of burgeoning of these new ideas about not just, you know, how to order life, but how to even create a a function functioning society without those organic bonds that had tied people together for all those centuries. And this in in the in the thought of the reactionary is the is where at, uh, Adam bites the apple basically. This is the fall because as soon as you destroy these bonds, this, as soon as you unseat God as as the the centerpiece of the social order, then it, all bets are off. Right. There there's no there's no center. Nothing nothing will will s- subsist. Uh, and therefore, anarchy is the only inevitable outcome of that. Whereas the um, the Enlightenment thinkers would uh, would would say natural law, you know, and, right. and human rights. Yeah. All the uh, monarchists and the reactionaries from De Maistre to oh, Burke was a bit more of a liberal, right? But the, but the real counter revolutionaries uh, at this moment in time, all they saw was relativism, mm-hmm. and all they saw was decay and destruction. Because without either that Catholic Church or that monarchy, but especially those two things together yes. in an absolute Catholic monarchy, yeah. how could society possibly function? How could you have um, order? And yeah, how can because, you maintain? Because but the two things together, they order social life and they order political life. Right. You know, it, you, God, God enthroned uh, as the arbiter of, of your social inter- intercourse. And then the king enthroned as the arbiter of all of your political decisions, right? Temporal uh, and spiritual, exactly. Right. And right. and and getting rid of that is to is to throw the whole thing uh, into a into a mad cocked hat. And you know, uh, if people looked at that uh, at the first five years of the revolution, I'm sure a lot of those guys were feeling very smug about that uh, uh, yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> analysis because it was a absolute uh, tempest. And uh, and uh, just a seesawing of factions and right. and and and, and, uh, and political violence yes. uh, that had not really been seen before, um, and it it sort of showed that well yeah here's what you have this is what you get yeah. you get well, a leviathan yeah. yeah you don't get you don't have anything that uh, that can bring all of these together so you're just going to have constant conflict and war uh, to, to 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 take the throne that that used to have the king on it. And, and to tie this to our, our last episode, uh, we had spoken about the difference between a purely political revolution, as we saw in the United States uh, at, around this time, uh, a little bit before it, and a social revolution. So what makes the French Revolution fascinating, if you take the English Civil War out, it is really, it's at least the first successful uh, you know, social revolution that happens that really not only overturns the political order, but also, as you say, upends in so many ways, you know, whether that's through laws or whether that's by the fucking guillotine, you know, the the old way of doing things. Yeah. So without relitigating the uh, the French Revolution, because God, you could have uh, what is that? That guy Duncan did like a fucking twenty five. Yeah. Uh, uh, what is it? History on Fire. Uh, no, Revolution. Revolution. Yeah. Yes. Oh my. Like twenty five episodes. Oh, great fucking podcast. Yeah. But yeah, it would take us probably twenty five episodes to do the French Revolution justice. Uh, uh, there is the. I guess it's apocryphal story that someone asked Su and Lai what he thought of the French Revolution. <laughs> (laughs) and he said too soon to tell yes (laughs) classic classic
Yeah, so without going into the entire French Revolution, the important thing to take away from it is that it's not only a social revolution, but it upturns uh, the, the, the potentialities and the possibilities and the reality of what it means to be a people and what it means to be a state. No, no longer is the state or the nation the prerogative of a single individual or a single class of aristocrats is based on law. Yes. It's based on uh, the uh, rights of man, right? Mm -hmm. The famous declaration of the, of the rights of men that comes out of that revolution. It is based on social contract, uh, something that we take for granted today, but uh, was very, very revolutionary in uh, that late 18th uh, century period. So, again, back and forth, the revolution goes up, it goes down, it goes this way, it goes that. We finally get, uh, I forget, what was it 1798 or was it in 1801? When does... Uh, I believe the coup of Brumaire is 99? 99. About on the cusp of the uh, 19th century, uh, a man comes along. He was the absolute boy, or as I guess they'd say in France, uh, le, le fil absolute uh, <laughs> of the uh, early 19th century, a guy by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte. And before I let Matt go off on one of the most amazing world historical figures of all time, I'd like to again put a little marker in there because he was born Napoleon Bonaparte. He's, He's a Guido. Corsican. He's an Italian. <laughs> folks, He's an Itai, folks. Imagine him <laughs> conquering at Auschwitz in a tracksuit. That was the reality <laughs> of Napoleon. This hero. He of learned French, French in, in, a, in a boarding school. He uh, was a native Italian speaker. He was uh, eating gabagool while he, he went to Waterloo, which yeah. is part of why he lost. He had, a, <laughs> he, had a, he had a wheel of provolone under his arm <laughs> that he would eat with a knife. He didn't want to go uh, in exile uh, to Elba. But uh, they told him there'd be uh, some good brajol there, yeah. so he went. Uh, so, so give us a little bit on this uh, Napoleon chap and what he does to kind of synthesize these different strains of yeah. uh, what's going on. Napoleon, uh, Hegel called him history on horseback. Yes. And he is the guy to point to if somebody doesn't understand the idea of historical dialectic processes. Because it is very abstract. It's hard to get. It, it, it's hard to... Certainly, if you've been taught history in the this happened, then this happened school, it's very hard to grasp the idea of, of things resolving through conflict. Yes. Uh, but Napoleon is like the example of a, of a dialectical figure emerging through a process. Because after the tumult of the French Revolution, in which I agree with Marx, uh, the, the Jacobins being bourgeois uh, property lovers were unable to give... Uh, the sansculot, the the urban poor, what they wanted, or the peasantry, for or the matter. peasants, they were yeah. not willing or able to do that. You could argue able, given the lack of you know development in prep capitalism at that point, uh, and they gave him instead a bunch of fucking headless nobles instead. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, and it's like, <laughs> hey, that's not the worst. That's not the worst <laughs> consolation prize. Yeah, Watching some all, fucking snooty dickhead <laughs> with a. With like a you know a doily around his neck, getting his head cut off. <laughs> Listen to that Bezos and Musk and all you guys. Exactly, it could, it could go that way. But yeah, but, go, go on, go on. Um, even within the Jacobin coalition, there was a constant jockeying between left and right, the Eberis and and uh, and, uh, and Danton and and uh, the, the Jacobins before the Thermidor were whack-a-boling left and right and trying to maintain this position in the center. Before the Thermidorians decided that enough was enough, they were worried about getting cut off their their own heads cut off. Uh, overthrew the Jacobins and instituted the Directory, which mm. was. Basically, everyone who didn't have any principles that would have gotten them killed during the first few years of the revolution. <laughs> it was the most venal, the most amoral people uh, in the revolution who had survived by not really having anything to make anybody want to kill them over because they were just going along to get along. Sounds familiar. Yeah, exactly. Like politics nowadays. Exactly. The and of the stupid bourgeoisie. And <laughs> so the directory has no politics, has no real ideology to itself beyond its own perpetuation. Uh, and but it, it's ruling a country that has been absolutely traumatized and riven by the traumas of the French Revolution and has emerged into two competing uh, factions, largely. You but, had, but also, too, I would say galvanized at the same time, absolutely, right? Yes. Because these factions are arising, and not that everybody went along with it, right? But it, it was a sea change, not just merely that they cut those aristocrats' fucking heads off and most of them, most of the families weren't coming back, right? But... Even at this point in time, it had reached a kind of turn, right, where it seemed like you couldn't go back for a lot. Oh, of people, absolutely. Right? No. And that's and that that was the only ideological commitment of the directory was not going back. Right. That's the thing that they did. That is the thing they actually believed in. 
They, they, they would not bring a, let the king come back. They would not let the old order come back. Uh, what they were going to do with it, they didn't really care so long. It, but that was one thing they actually cared about. It was purely negative, yeah. right? This is what we don't want. Exactly. But they were ruling over a country that, inv- that uh, had a defeated but still, still you know, ex- extant and, and resentful left wing, uh, the, 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 the people who'd supported the Jacobins, and a resurgent monarchist right. Right. Uh, uh, you know, the people who'd survived the Vendée and, and things like that. Uh, the the Muscadine youth, <laughs> yeah. uh, and not to mention the other ghouls, the aristocrats outside of France who are itching to yes. get in and uh, counter revolution themselves. Absolutely. Right? And by the way, the Muscadine youth were the first Proud Boys. Were they? Really? They were indeed. They what? were. They were these. They were uh, the sons of the arist- aristocracy who had survived the terror, uh, who were empowered in the aftermath of Thermidor to basically do street justice on the Jacobins on behalf of the Directory, and they went around perfumed. Uh, in in extravagant regalia to to show their their elevated social status and would do street crimes on on noted uh, radicals and republican officers so. I mean, this is neither here, here nor there but a who was their gavin mcginnis and b is there a lithograph of that person uh <laughs> you know inserting a butt plug into their ass and uh popping it right out because uh... given the, given what uh <laughs> given the kind of stuff that was printed in in, uh, in french revolutionary <laughs> era <laughs> in french revolutionary era publications that probably exists yeah. so he decided probably fucking uh, rub one out to that absolutely but anyways <laughs> so the directory is this hollow center. Does sound familiar? A center right. having power but with no popular legitimacy. Right, right. Only persisting on momentum. And it spent five years playing, like I said, like the Jacobins had, only on an expanded ideological spectrum, whack-a-mole. They would empower the left to suppress the right. When the right became too powerful, they would suppress the right with the help of the left. Uh, and there, this is the classic... Synth- and you know uh, thesis antithesis concept mm-hmm. and it was not stable then the fi- napoleon bonaparte who conspired with a few of the uh, the less scrupulous people in the directory to seize power in 8 a- 1799 mm-hmm. uh, uh emerges as a figure who synthesizes both of these energies he represents the revolution in that he is not a Bourbon. He is not an aristocrat, at least a high aristocrat. He was a lowly aristocrat mm. in Corsica, but, I mean, that barely counts. Mm. Um, he, he came through the Republican army. He'd been a yes, Jacobin. Right. He'd been arrested after Thermidor for right. his, because of his close relationship with the Robespierre brothers. Right. Uh, so he has the imperature of, of the revolution. He is a revolutionary uh, 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 warrior. But by being the, this single power... By being this this monarchical figure, by by representing the pomp and glory of a unified France, yes. he hits all those all those things that the monarchists are craving too. Now, there's not this doesn't mean that there's an end to these conflicts and that there aren't people on the left and right who are unhappy with Napoleon. There right. are, but that constant ebb and flow, that conflict, is largely resolved in the figure of Napoleon. And that I mean, that that's fascinating shit. I mean, everyone go back to your Hegel and look at uh, this this historian on horseback here. But it's not <laughs> just that he, um, you, you know, as you said, he synthesizes these two, you know, dialectical forces within the revolution. Right. But uh, as I said, the um, the powers outside who saw their own. Um, power and authority threatened by this new conception of the French Revolution very quickly started to first uh, try to, you know, overthrow the revolution from the inside, but then, of course, start to attack France itself. And Napoleon and the Republican army, which for the, you know, for the first time, these are mercenaries, right? This is a yes. dedicated army. The first of, of its kind in yeah, Europe. Conscript, yes. Conscripts, right? Mm-hmm. Who are, uh, have fervently believe in a secular idea. And Napoleon starts to conquer. He rinses their asses. He sure as fuck Everywhere. does. He goes to the fucking east. He goes up to the north, to the northeast. And we all know what happens uh, with a land war in Russia. Never but, do that, uh, guys. <laughs> if you're ever in a position, just don't do it. This is, this uh, is, this is the kind of special, um, you know, kind of life lessons that we yeah. give here uh, behind the paywall. You know, don't don't invade Russia. Don't, bad, come on, guys. Idea, don't do idea. it. What do you think? What are you thinking? <laughs> so, so, uh, but that but what he's doing yeah. while this is happening, while he's creating this unprecedented nationalist military that is able to just rinse the old powers of Europe, Habsburgs, uh, uh, Prussians, yeah. everybody, yep. uh, the Italians, the Italians done for. Uh, he just couldn't get the goddamn British on the high seas. That ah, was really it. Yeah. 
Not all. But yeah. you know, that's like that, at that point, it's like hundreds of years of naval tradition. Yeah. You can't really make that up in the time span he had. Yeah, I mean, not to like drop the H word, but uh, you know, Hitler had the same exact problem, right? There's That's a, true. You know, Europe, Europe's bounded. It's yeah. like you're either going to fa- face that naval power all the way exactly. in the west, or that deep step in that tundra out yeah. in the east. And, and, those, uh, and those little Fauntleroys that are out there on the high <laughs> sea, running the shit, and you can't fucking beat them. But uh, but while while he's doing this, he's creating nationalism, right? Because. Because what the ministry and the reactionary said is you've dethroned God, what's going to replace him? And what comes out of the French Revolution after all of the turmoil and the, the head chopping and the coups and counter coups, what comes out is the nation. Right. That is the next step. That is the, that is the next abstraction, the next eternal abstraction that will engage the minds and souls of the European people to replace God. We, can now, we, we now see ourselves as part of a continuum. From history, from our ancestors to our children and their children, and embodied in the nation. Right. And Napoleon's wars are what make that, because not only is he exemplifying uh, the power of nationalism through his military successes in all the countries he fights and invades and takes over, the conflict between these French-speaking rulers and and these locals who might speak Polish or, or uh, German or Italian or whatever. That sparks in them this notion of difference and this question of, well, where is our version of this? Yes, exactly. Where, where, is, our, where is our nation right. that can do this so that we don't get guys in blue uniforms <laughs> marching up and down in our streets? Who actually had something to fight for exactly. and were creating a unified exactly. project that, you know, despite all the ups and downs, as you said, of the revolutionary period, and then under the, the first empire of uh, Napoleon and then the second republic, and then you have a third empire, right? Uh, there is still... You know, this this unified sense of the nation that, again, to put a point on this, did not exist previously. No, that's it, the thing. It, it, and that's what's so it's funny. It's a new thing, unique in history. These people, largely the Raspalians, they are they are uh, lamenting the death of these nations. And they and they cling to this idea of nationality that largely was birthed by the very people who they most despise, yes. the French revolutionaries. Right, right. And it was to make it even worse, and this ties into what you're talking about with the nationalist uh, insp- uh, aspirations of peoples all over Europe. That takes, you know, over a hundred years, 150 years for many of them to be actually realized yeah. uh, through history. Right. So this revolutionary nationalism uh, becomes this aspiration for peoples all over Europe. It's this Pandora's box, you know, that mm-hmm. you cannot, you know, put away. Uh, it, it, it moves forward, and the, and even though. France through the 19th century vacillates between being a somewhat autocratic, although relatively still free um, empire, right? Yep. Under a absolute, ru- not absolute ruler, right? I should say a, uh, authoritarian ruler. Yeah. And in periods of very chaotic, quote unquote, Republican democracy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Raspel, the, the, the latter day Raspels, um, never got over this. Uh, never got over the fact that, as Matt said, not only was the old order overthrown, right, but that these principles of human rights and universal rights not good, arose. Yeah. So when you're thinking about how is it that in this day and age somebody could be writing about um, this destruction of the West, this internal decadent destruction of itself by these principles of live and let live and uh, turn the other cheek and accept other people in, uh, you know, to your community who may have a different way of thinking or a different religion, right? Um, That, for us, seems normal now, right? But if you never, from the beginning, had these Enlightenment principles, if you never thought that the French Revolution should have happened, which millions of French still believe to this day, yeah. right? Then of course Including it makes Macron, sense. Macron, by the way. Inclu- all right, okay. He has basically said that, that, he, that, that, he, that it was bad. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. Even, even uh, fucking Putin says that Stalin's good. <laughs> <laughs> fucking Macron. Talk about the empty center, right? Yeah, Jesus. So yeah, Napoleon, I mean, ups and downs, we all know what happens. Maybe you don't, but uh, that's for another time. Um, France goes on from there. And France, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult for us. The French Revolution creates a left and a right. Yes. But it's not like liberal and conservative that you see in the, in the United States. French grenouille politics is all fucking scrambled. It's not just these monarchists, but as we'll see as you move forward in history, all these events happen 
that uh, take this nationalism and that begins as a sort of Republican, almost liberal left nationalism Mm -hmm. and kind of distorts it and turns it into this right nationalism. Um, the 18th Brumaire, right? So Napoleon's great nephew, uh, Louis Napoleon, right? Yes. Arises. His, uh, uh, his failed nephew, yes. Yes, his failed nephew arises again in a, in a fit of unification. If you haven't read The 18th Brumaire of Napoleon Bonaparte by Karl Marx, do so. It is some of the most um, inspiring and inspired uh, political writing, uh, I think, of, and, of all time. And, and incredibly, to my mind, uh, relevant, uh, the way he, he writes about how... Uh, like a bourgeois, a ruling class that is unable to basically get on the same page and sort of cedes control of the state to a buffoonish outsider right. who then sort of consolidates a, and resolves their conflicts in his own person, I think something we can all relate to. Yes, and also importantly to how the... Um the underclass, how the peasants and many of the working class were actually the ones that rally yes. to the side of uh, this usurper. Absolutely, that's the and that's the one that sticks with me. Is yeah. is is he famously? Uh, Marx describes the French uh, peasantry who supported Napoleon in huge numbers uh, as a sack of potatoes, yes. which a lot of people have taken to be some sort of insult, some sort of calumny. It sounds like it, it but it's, it's sound, a metaphor. It's, it's a, metaphor. a metaphor. What yeah. he's saying is that when is that he's he's speaking of the of the 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 the, the transformational power of being a member of a class. Because these, one of the central Marxian insights is that if you get a bunch of people together who are living in the same place, doing the same job, they will a- acquire a class consciousness by yes. virtue of their proximity to one another and their shared labor and exploitation. Yes. And, and that's why if you get a bunch of working class people together in, in a neighborhood like the Red Belts of Paris, yes, they're yeah. going to become, and they did become, yes. incredibly radical and unified. Right. But, he, but if you get a bunch of peasants together, and, you, and the thing is you don't get a bunch of peasants together because they all live on little plots right. miles away from each other. The only time you get them together is during an election. Uh, so when you yes. bring them yep. together... It's like if you put all of the working people together, they're going to turn into something else. Mm. But if you take all of the work of the peasants together, the, and you, pu- it's like if you put a bunch of potatoes in a sack. Yeah, these lumpy things that don't come together. It'll ju- yeah. If you put a bunch of potatoes in a bag, it doesn't turn into another thing. Right. It's just a sack of potatoes, and that's what he's saying yes. when he says that. Yes. He's saying that the peasants do not catalyze right. when they're voting because they have no shared experience. And to me, that is what we've re peasantized yes. the western worker yes. through suburbanization yeah, and we, mass media how we and ended we last time. yeah exactly yeah, 100% and yeah. so that's why i think that's a great book to read but yeah. uh, but he talks about how napoleon napoleon the 3rd this goofus who had th- th- three times failed in a coup attempt to just take power by invading france yep, yep. uh it just uh, a, a a chronic cr- crook swindler a guy who owed everybody money and basically had to become emperor so that he could pay off his debt <laughs> sounds familiar folks it's, it's, it, i mean that's the thing it's like the comparison between uh, napoleon the third and trump is only wrong insofar that it is it really under uh it really doesn't do good service to napoleon the third because napoleon the third was a guy who really like spent his whole life trying to be yeah, take over france right. he read like he went to jail yeah. and when he was in jail he read a bunch of books yeah. he wrote a book about pov- the end of poverty which, yeah. which became a catalyst for a lot of the the people who supported and him and not to mention when he comes into power he, there is a, a period of stability yeah, after that exactly uh, unlike uh, trump's shiftless shapeless yeah, fucking yeah. no yeah. Uh, that's that it's just it's like a copy of a copy of a copy. Right. It's like the fifteenth guy who who in uh, multiplicity, the fifteenth right. Michael Keaton, <laughs> tragedy um, farce, and then who knows what the fuck uh, the no, next just, thirteen yeah. are. <laughs> it's like uh, armpit farts or something. I don't know, <laughs> but but yeah. So uh, Napoleon the Third is able to consolidate control, uh, 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 resolve the conflicts between like the 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 uh, uh, aristocratic landowning uh, uh, legitimists. And the the uh, finance capital uh, Orleanists and the working class and the peasantry, uh, and that lasts uh, for a, it's for a good twenty years. Yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's impressive more than his uncle because he didn't invade Russia. <laughs> right, exactly. but what he did ended up doing was fighting Prussia. Uh, you and don't want to fuck with those jumpers. If it, if it ends in R U S S I A and you are a Bonaparte, just stay away. <laughs> now, you're talking about, of course, the Franco-Prussian War. And um, I want to actually put some historical context into this because I was thinking about this in in preparation for the event. If you were born, let's say, in 18, let's say 1850, 1855 in France, it's not likely, but it would be entirely possible that there were three humongous wars in your lifetime, Mm -hmm. like 
total wars, essentially. The Franco-Prussian War, which ends in 1971 with the Paris Commune, and then you have a period of relative peace, and then you have World War I and World War II. This, I think, goes a lot, goes very far in kind of understanding like the, the French political makeup and the French understanding of the world. All these brutal, just atrocious wars that, that, that kill millions of people, but also require a certain type of state in order to prosecute those sorts of wars. Yeah. So, because the, the French were always the first. And yes. Which is why the French were sort of uh, exempt from a lot of the stuff we talked about last time about peasant society sort of maintaining a homeostasis and, and sort of venting off before violence exploded. Mm. They would just get violent uh, in <laughs> a way that would down. not happen in the UK or in, or in, uh, in uh, Germany or, or Italy or anywhere else. It was yeah. it was very much different because it was it was they were the first ones. They were yeah. the harbingers always. And, they were the catalysts. And maybe they are today because people know the gilets jaunes, the yes. yellow vests are out there. And uh, I think we'll definitely get to that towards the end. Let's talk about another thing the French were first at um, in uh, 1871, uh, facing a defeat by Prussia. Um, Basically, the ruling class flees Paris, uh, which is under siege. And uh, the working class of Paris does a first, uh, a first thing in history. They actually have what I think we all consider to this day to be the first working class proletarian revolution and start to begin and create the first proletarian uh, quasi-state shall we say, in the form of the Paris Commune uh, for a hundred and something days. I forget uh, uh, how many. Uh, essentially, the working class was in charge of Paris. It created all sorts of political institutions in terms of uh, recallable delegates. Uh, it had its own sort of economic apparatus where they would make sure, even under this, these scarce conditions of a siege, that everybody would get you know, what they needed in order to survive moving forward. There were all sorts of grandiose plans you know, about uh, taking this kind of moment of temporary freedom in this uh, temporary autonomous zone of Paris, yeah. right? And kind of um, making real the dreams of socialism, anarchism, communism that are all floating around Europe, but especially Paris, the Paris of Proudhon and the Paris of Blanqui, mm -hmm. you know, at this time. And um, so inspirational, such an inspirational moment that when uh, after the uh, Bolshevik Revolution, there was a giant celebration among Lenin and everybody when they surpassed the amount of days <laughs> in uh, <laughs> Petrograd that they had in, uh, in Paris. So... Again, you know, France is first out the, out the gate with a, a new form of uh, proletarian revolution, one that inspires us to this day, but also, of course, is an object of complete revulsion, not only at that time, uh, but to this day. To, you know, the, the Dumont, because the denouement, I should say, because we could talk again a whole episode about the Paris Commune, right, is that it was Thiers, right? Actually, mm -hmm. it was Adolphe Thiers, who Thier started as a Orleanist uh, liberal. Uh, uh, during the July Revolution. He convinced the Prussians, who were just as scared of this working-class insurrection and this budding sort of proletarian democracy as all the rest of the ruling class, uh, he convinced the Prussians, who they were losing a war to, <laughs> to let the fucking French troops go through the, pr the, the Prussian lines in order to fucking pacify and brutally massacre this fucking revolt of the Paris Commune. And now we're at Père Lachaise, and you can still go there and see those bullet holes in that wall. Yeah. where people were lined up and shot. But again, like this is the sort of intense and, and brutal but also fascinating and inspiring history that uh, France just keeps coming up with over and over and over again. It's true. The Paris Commune brings in um, the Third Republic. Yes. Right? So the third time's the charm, I We guess. got it. This we is it. The this. last one. Never going to be another one. one. The eternal Third <laughs> Republic of France. Uh, by the way, folks, they're on number five right now, but uh, <laughs> with a little Vichy in between. Uh, the Third Republic is, I think, this very crucial and fascinating moment um, in terms of these ideas of nationalism uh, and in terms of state formation and economic development um, in France at this time. Because despite the political coalitions of the Third Republic, whether it was the radicals who were actually the liberals or it was the socialists who were they were either the nationalists or the uh, internationalist ones or the right wing parties or the monarchist parties, there was a lot of jockeying back and forth for power through this long period all the way from uh, 1871 all the way up until 1939 mm -hmm. when the uh, Nazis come and, uh, and, and take them over, right? Yeah. But it is at this moment in time that 
France, for example, uh, all those people we spoke about who didn't speak French, who spoke, you know, Gascon, Breton, whatever, uh, Breton uh, Al- in Alsace, they yeah. spoke uh, uh, German, right? Yeah. This was the moment in time where this modern conception of the nation state as being a linguistic and cultural whole uh, really takes shape and it takes place in France. And they actually force. Um, all of the people in the provinces in France to start to only learn French. Yep. And they ban the use of other languages at this time. Peasants into Frenchmen is a great book on uh, that subject. All right, there you go, folks. Uh, also, of course, the state itself, because it has a lot of needs, uh, they saw getting defeated in the Franco-Prussian War that they had the need to kind of step up their game when it came to a, another uh, a military confrontation, right? But you also had this process of capital accumulation increasing and increasing and increasing uh, and very much tied to the power of the state, which is p- tied to the power of finance capital and this, that, and the other. And so as the Third Republic goes along, I think there's a couple of events, two very important events that show a, a sort of shift in French history and also, I think, crucially, a way to understand this reactionary uh, French ideology. Those two shifts are, of course... Um, Boulanger Mm -hmm. and uh, Boulangerism and the Dreyfus Affair, uh, two events that happen within a decade of one another in the uh, late 19th century and sort of show the beginnings of a shift from nationalism in the French sense being this sort of left or liberal Republican uh, type of ideology and practice into nationalism becoming something right wing, something becoming reactionary, something becoming something that's tied to blood, soil and church and Catholicism and something that um, actually in a lot of ways has some sort of echoes of fascism in it, um, you know, before fascism actually arises. Yes. So uh, Boulanger, tell us a little bit about this uh, very prescient figure, Boulanger. All right. So George uh, George, uh, (laughs) Boulanger uh, was a French general. Uh, in the in the Third Republic period, uh, who is known for being the spokesman for revanchism, a, a phrase that came into being in post uh, Franco Prussian War. That means France. revenge. Exactly. <laughs> like we got to get back at these dirty krauts for stealing our our precious provinces. We want Alsace and Lorraine. We want it back. Uh, and and he became a celebrity. Basically, he was. In the 1880s, early 1880s, he was a figure who stood for a, a resolution once again to these same tensions because they, they'd killed a ton of communards and sent a bunch more to Devil's Island, but they had not obviously you know, been able to extinguish the working class or its or interests. Uh, and so France was still riven with, with political differences. There were, there were anarchists running around yes. doing propaganda of the deed out of the yin-yang. Stabbing a president in the heart, for example, yes. as happened in uh, 1893. But yeah. yes, yeah, blowing shit up. Yep. Uh, uh, and, and, of course, a, a still very uh, hostile and uh, mobilized uh, right wing, uh, but also you know, a, a burgeoning middle class that's uh, just experiencing the same uh, economic deprivations as everyone else during yes. this period, which was a, a sort of a, a global... Uh, uh, depressive t- periods, uh, similar, uh, in, less intense, but similar the, to what the, happened in the 20th century. What they call the first Great Depression. Yes, exactly. And, and, and you, know. you also um, have at this at this moment a rise in literary culture, right? Yes. Not just uh, literacy, but also all sorts of like this burgeoning of the free press at this time. So it's possible for somebody like this to become a celebrity in a, in a quasi-modern sense. Yeah. But so France is riven by these seemingly irreconcilable conflicts. And Boulanger became a figure who attracted both left and right nationalists as a figure who could cut through it, who could go on horseback as Napoleon and Napoleon III had done before and, and abolish basically this parliament of, of, of jabbering ninnies who were refuse, fa- failing to address on these, these pressing issues. Uh, and he had giant rallies uh, supporting him. He had cadres of supporters throughout the country. Uh, he was at a point uh, where he could have said go and la- attempted anyway to launch a coup. Yes. Uh, but at the last moment, he essentially just chickened out. He blinked. He blinked. Yeah. And he said, I don't think this is going to work. And then he went to Belgium. Uh, he, vis- he went to the grave of his dead mistress and he blew his brains out. <laughs> uh, and An so, honorable death, at least. Yes. Yeah. And so uh, his movement meant to nothing, but those um, th- that conception of of a, of a syncretic figure bringing together the left and right 
uh, around around a, a muscular sort of nationalist project is the seed for for uh, European fascism. Yes. Uh, yeah. The Jamie actually asked me before I came here today because we're in Matt's apartment. I drove over from mine, and Jamie said, "Make sure you talk about." Uh, you know, what the working class's role in right wing populism is, because it's very important in this age of Trump where the quote unquote white working class is seen as this sort of, um, you know, wholly reactionary, essentially reactionary force that uh, holds up, you know, Trumpism and white supremacy or whatever. I think what what this figure Boulanger does is um, for the first time he breaks off sections of the working class who had been almost exclusively uh, socialist uh, mm-hmm. or anarchist, of course, anarcho syndicalist, especially at this moment in time, and um, manages to create a sort of socialism that is tied to this idea of the French nation. So it is a socialism that is national, yes. which is why a lot of folks say that this was in the late 19th century, the sort of beginning of what you see yeah. of national socialism and fascism that would arise you know, a generation because after. Because, uh, so nationalism has shown itself to be one of the most enduring obstacles toward toward socialist progress yeah. and to a certain class of people who emerge on the left and, and even members of the, the working class there eventually comes a point where you think well if you can't beat them join them right like just 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 say hey you guys love the nation right well what if you know what if we had uh what if what if the nation meant that we controlled our means of production? But the thing about that is, it requires the continued demonization of those outside. Yes, it requires the because con- the, the the teleology of Marxism is that the internationalism eventually dissolves the need for all right. of the these horrifyingly repressive apparatuses. But uh, but this national socialism, it's you're you really are uh, making the the Faustian bargain because you are entrenching all of the most awful authoritarian aspects of the state yes uh in 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 uh, in pursuit of very short term and, and ephemeral gains right right but all, and also at the same time you are doing another synthesis now it's it's bizarre because it's an ideological synthesis now of what you were speaking about earlier with the french revolution um it's a synthesis of this uh, thing you can't touch this thing you can't feel but this thing that you understand and you know and you would sacrifice called the nation, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, some sense of like collective social well-being, right, where people will be taken care of. Um, This, of course, you know, Mussolini was an ex-socialist, and uh, Hitler obviously has the National Socialist title right uh, in his party. But um, this is really, I think, the beginning of of where we see the 20th century start. It starts in the late 19th century. Besides the uh, Boulanger affair, you have the uh, Dreyfus affair, and this is where things really start to heat up because now you have this combination of what Matt was talking about with this right-wing nationalism along with the rise of a virulent anti-Semitism. Albert Dreyfus, he was a military captain, another really long story, but he was accused of selling um, state military secrets to the Prussians. There was a closed trial by a military tribunal. Um, he was sentenced to life in prison, was sent to Devil's Island uh, for the rest of his life, except that a, um, his family and a bunch of intellectuals started to look into the case, and it looked like he had been framed. And at first, uh, historians note that he was framed for being Alsatian, which means that he was a native German speaker, right? So there was already this fear at this moment in time of somebody who spoke another language and had a different quote-unquote culture, right? But later on, uh, very much was made of the fact that he was Jewish. He was an assimilated Jew, right? But um, it was very much, it started to push these buttons of modern Mm -hmm. anti-Semitism to say that, well, we have a nation, but this is somebody who might have some sympathies towards something outside of the nation. This is somebody who may seem to be assimilated, right? But are they really French? Mm -hmm. You know, Uh, are they really German? Are they really Italian? So the Dreyfus affair it does two things. A, it completely fucking... France is riven uh, by two sides, on the Dreyfusards and the anti-Dreyfusards. It's the military lining up against the politicians. It's one politician against another. It is the rise of... And I learned this the other day. The first time the word intellectual had ever been used was in the Dreyfus case. Mm. Because um, it was actually when Zola uh, does his famous... Jacques. Jacques. 
uh, and is sent to jail for a year uh, for breaking uh, press laws and libeling, uh, you know, the French military. The folks who line up behind Dreyfus um, to try to, you know, win back his freedom because he had been essentially not only tarred and feathered as a, um, you know, conniving Jew, uh, but also as a traitor um, for the purposes of some, you know, military cadre and blah, blah, blah. Um, the intellectuals, um, for the first time against public opinion as a separate group, take a stand for Dreyfus. And, uh, many of them, uh, they protest, they write, some of them go to jail for this and they're isolated now as this separate force in society, right? Because they're standing up for these, you know, uh, Republican principles, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, these civic principles, justice under the law. Right. And this is where for the first time in history, anti-intellectualism, starts to be tied to reactionary politics. Again, first time in France. Mm -hmm. You isolate these people as intellectuals who are against the French state. They're against the French military. They are against, you know, the rightful uprooting of these Jewish uh, fifth columnists, you know, within our country. These these intellectuals are against the nation itself. So for the first time, too, not de Maestro, who was a brilliant man, right? Uh, Not many of the great reactionary thinkers who were monarchists before that, uh, like um, Gobineau, right, Who, who famously creates race theory, right? For the first time, you have this reactionary impulse con- tied with an really. anti-intellectual one at the same time, yes. right? That these pinheads up there think they know the better than the people. As, yes, uh, of negativity, Culpa. right? Yeah. So really, like at this point in time, you have um, a, a new far right arise. Yeah. Uh, one that might still have some monarchical pretensions, right? But groups like Action Francaise uh, arrive, which are ultra-Catholic, uh, proto-fascists. Uh, you have these sort of ideas of integralism and uh, a huge ferment as like the left and the right jockeys for power. And things seem to be more and more uh, unstable in France. Now, something happens which uh, Morat, uh, Charles Morat, I, I believe his name yes. is, the head of uh, Action Francaise, calls a divine, uh, divine surprise, hmm. which is that even though uh, the French right wing was, of course, nationalistic, and most of them were um, germophobic, uh, France falls to Hitler. And Hitler, because there were enough right wingers in France in uh, 1939, as we jumped to the beginning of the uh, Second World War, there were enough of these uh, right wingers that he was able to actually form a pretty cohesive and functioning government uh, in Vichy based out of these reactionaries that were coming from this period and were also, you know, radicalized by the First World War, as so many other people were, and prone to violence and wanted something that they called the uh, Revolution Nationale. Yes, they, there, was a, there, was a, there was a saying uh, amongst the right wing uh, in France before uh, w- World War II, uh, better Hitler than Bloom. Right, uh, Leon, Leon Blum, Blum being the first uh, popular front socialist Jewish uh, prime minister of France. Exactement ça. Uh, the famous, uh, you know, slogan or the famous motto of the French Republic that comes out of that great war, uh, uh, revolutionary war we were talking about, is uh, Egalité, Liberté, and Fraternité. Mm-hmm. So, of course, that's liberty, equality, and fraternity, or brotherhood, whatever the case may be, right? Um, the Vichy government, again, all French, uh, change that, and they come up with uh, another term. It is uh, travail, family, et patrie. So it's instead of liberty, fraternity, and brotherhood, uh, I'm sorry, liberty, equality, and brotherhood, it is work, family, and country. So this is what so many French had wanted on this reactionary right for so long, and Vichy gives them the opportunity to make this real. Figures like Marshal Patin uh, and Laval and others uh, form this government and um, control France for, the, for most of the Second World War and try to have essentially a counter-revolution, not only politically, but also in terms of um, uh, secularism. You know, they bring, try to bring the church back into people's lives. They uh, valorize work with a sort of corporatism that's very similar to Mussolini's fascism. And... Um, you know, it's not that people liked it. There was a lot of resistance, but uh, Hitler found some useful idiots there uh, to do these things. Now, the important thing as we move farther into the 20th century, almost get to the end of our French story because we have to end it eventually, right, is that um, there's a lot said in France about the resistance. Viva la resistance, mm-hmm. right? Of course, the resistance was many folks. It was uh, Charles de Gaulle. It was um, many Republicans who hated 
Nazis and also hated Vichy. Uh, uh, but especially it was the left wing, the communists and the socialists who had been suppressed yep. uh, uh, after, of course, the fall of France. So coming out of the Second World War, the left and the real left, the true left, has a lot of momentum behind it, right? Um, it is entirely possible, and de Gaulle and the rest of the powers, uh, you know, Churchill and Roosevelt, Truman, uh, and even Stalin to an extent, are afraid of what would happen if this indigenous French communist movement were to actually take power because they were the ones shooting the Nazis. They were the ones fighting against the Vichy government. Mm -hmm. They were the ones that had most of the support from the people. They were promising more than just, you know, a retreat back to the popular front, you know, uh, republicanism of the of the of the third period. They were instead saying that when this ends, when we have smashed fascism, we will actually move forward and make real these sort of aspirations of the working class of France. Of course, that could not happen. Yeah, no, you could not. not have, you could not have such a thing. No, no. Uh, right across the English Channel from uh -huh. one of our greatest allies. Yeah, not so happen. Vichy is defeated when Hitler is defeated in 1945. But importantly, the reactionaries are not defeated. Similar to what happens in Germany with denazification, which, by the way, leaves thousands and thousands of Nazis in power uh, in West Germany after the Second World War turns into a huge scandal later on. In France, most of the people who had collaborated in the Vichy regime are let go. Maybe they serve a little time in prison, but then they are brought right back into the power structures, whether that's L'Oreal, the cosmetics uh, company. Uh, the head of that was a fascist. Uh, Coco Chanel yes. had uh, uh, famously collaborated with the fascists. They're let back into you know, the, the economy and allowed to move forward. But then politically as well, the Gaullist uh, Fourth Republic state is riven with former Vichy fascists. Mm -hmm. So the communists do not come to power, of course. Uh, they are actually given a seat in uh, de Gaulle's government. Uh, and uh, actually a lot of their demands for you know, the beginnings of a real social welfare state and rights of unions uh, and the franchise are granted to them. But now you have almost like, a, I don't know how many times after tragedy and farce, you know, where we're at, but another figure, Charles de Gaulle, who of course fights uh, as, with the Free French Army and leads it, right? Uh, de Gaulle comes to power and creates something called de Gaulleism, which is this almost, almost new sort of like uh, syncretic sort of... Uh, I don't know dialectical. Yeah, he's another guy who 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 is resolving uh, the these this nationalism, and more than anything, he is a guy who is giving France a way to think about the war that ex that uh, excuses them from uh, any sort of uh, guilt, because in the person of De Gaulle, the guy who was a pillar of the French uh, military, a, a massive establishment prick. figure, yeah. total a, massive, a, yeah, a, a right winger <laughs> in any in any way you slice it, yeah. But he didn't. He didn't sign on with Patin. He did not stick around to be a Vichy stooge. He went across the English Channel and and resisted. And so he is a figure who can embody uh, the resistance without embodying the inherent radicalism yes. of the people who actually carried out the resistance. Exactly. And he can he can argue actually too, which they did, that France was never defeated, mm -hmm. right? Because there was this outside group of French yes. who were not Vichy. They yes. were the non-Vichy. And they were the ones who the U.S. military let be the first people into Paris when they liberated it. De Gaulle had to fight real hard for that because the Americans fucking hated yeah. him. Roosevelt well, and Churchill. Would, he was a huge prick. <laughs> he was. The, like he, uh, the record of, of Western powers dealing with De Gaulle is just... Guys being like, this dude is such a fucking prick. Such a prick. Total fucking prick. <laughs> but you know what he also did, too, which is important. I think why the, why the French uh, ultimately did rally around them to an extent is that he did plot a course. And this is important, I think, coming to the present day with the EU of a certain amount of French independence when right. it came to world affairs. Exactly. And that's that, that's that syncretic thing of you are embodying you know, uh, many elements of reaction and you certainly are not uh, abandoning capitalism. You support capitalism. Yep. But you are not going to be absorbed into the Anglo-American hive yes. yep. uh, post-war. And that gives you the sense... That's a thing that could appeal to people across all of these ideological divides in France. He's a Republican, and he's a nationalist, and he's able to unite these factions. And he's even able to give the communists a seat at the table, yes. which actually becomes one of the largest parties in France. Folks mm -hmm. might not know that, but up until the fall of the... Uh, 
of the wall and the end of uh, so-called uh, really existing socialism. Um, you know, the, the French Communist Party, maybe the Italian Communist Party yeah, was those bigger, are the one but, and two, yeah. but yeah, one and two up there, like, like the French, the French working class was highly organized, yeah. highly radicalized, fought, but they fought within, on the grounds that de Gaulle had created for them right. with the Fourth Republic. Yes. So a huge crisis comes, because this is something that we've, we haven't touched on at all yet, but of course, France, like, like uh, England and like Spain and Portugal was a colonial power, yeah. right? They had uh, lands, colonies uh, all over the world. They had them especially in a place called Vietnam, mm. uh, Indochina, as they called it then, where uh, famously when they lost in uh, 54 to uh, the Vietnam, Kong, uh, the United States came in and tried to bail out that huge disaster, and uh, yeah, yeah, you know, two million uh, dead Vietnamese. Yeah, uh, they offered later. them a nuke. Did Nick, they? Or that was Nixon's uh, suggestion to Eisenhower was to is to give him a nuke to De Gaulle. Yeah, wow, that would have gone real well. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> that's like Truman almost nuked fucking North Korea and yeah. China and the ugh, yeah. Korean War. Uh, talk about alternate histories, right? But even closer to home, and I think even more traumatic for the French people, especially the Respals of the world, because we're now we're at the time right now. Respals born the, the the author of this novel is born in 1924, and like all sick fucking ghoulish ogre right wing psychopaths like Henry Kissinger, that motherfucker's still around. He's 96. <laughs> fucking years oh, old this guy Lord. lived through vichy right oh, he lived yes, through yeah. maybe the greatest trauma for the french right wing which was tied you know they were obviously tied to this right wing nationalism but they're also tied to imperialism that if france is such a great and powerful uh civilization and power right they have the right indeed the obligation to go to places like vietnam to go to places like french guiana to go especially right right next door you know across the mediterranean in a place like algeria Right. And uh, create a settler colonial state and, uh, you know, control the lives of uh, five million Muslims and let one million, you know, Frenchmen go there and, and take all the fucking industry and, yeah. and make all the fucking money. Well, of course, as we know, this is the era of decolonization. You have a battle of Algiers, if you will, uh, between the FLN, which is the uh, kind of resistance uh, in Algeria against French rule. And um, this question of whether France should give up its colonial possessions or not, again, like it, it's, it's a it, um, it's a huge fracture point in uh, in French politics. Oh, yeah. To the extent that uh, even under de Gaulle uh, in 1958 and in 1961, little known fact, there were two attempted military coups by Algerian generals against France. Yeah. Right. This is not the same as like, you know, American history where things are relatively stable. You had the possibility in the fifties yeah. and sixties, you would have had a military coup right wing that would have overthrown democracy. I mean, when you look at, yeah, comparably in America, what? When like MacArthur got mad, he got fired <laughs> right. in North Korea, and then he just he just came in Congress and gave like a bitchy speech, <laughs> yeah. or I the mean, bankers coup yeah, under Roosevelt, like, which is like if, like five know, jerk yeah. offs, yeah, like, and yeah. they're like, oh, never mind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but no, there there were there were soldiers massing in the fucking forests outside France, yes. when, or Paris when this was it was generally being mooted, and of course a wave of assassination attempts against the Gaulle. Oh yeah, you have a, an organization called OAS. I'm not even going to look up what that stands for. It's something fascist and right wing and colonial but uh they they were like the uh the right wing like military death squads you know yeah. that would go around and uh these folks were again highly right wing and highly tied into the power structures there de gaulle barely escapes these coups and eventually of course algeria is given independence uh, by a vote of the french people and they vote overwhelmingly to allow the algerians uh self-governance but it's something that uh the raspels of the world will never forget because that was really the end of their colonial rule which brings us I think maybe to the most exciting moment in recent French history for us, but for the reactionaries, uh, maybe the most frightening thing that possibly could have happened, which is in May 68, the students of Paris and elsewhere in France start some protests. They throw up, as the French always do, a bunch of barricades. I love the barricades. In the oh. Latin Quarter. They fight off the police. The police attack them. They attack back. So la pave la plage. Uh, the situation is slogans are flying. So are rocks. So is tear gas. So are batons. The police are going at it. The students are going at it. The students 
these are Maoists and Trotskyists and all sorts of new lefty students. And they're like, why don't we go to the factories and we'll talk to the workers in the factories. And the Communist Party, which controls the unions, says, no, don't go talk to the workers. And the students, they go talk to the workers. And the workers say, oh, we don't like the police either. We're going to have a general strike. Ten million French workers, spontaneous wild, ge- wildcat general strike, which literally shuts down France yeah. for over a week. The president of the republic flees. <laughs> there is this moment in time where if things had gone another way, everything was there yep. for there to be an actual communist revolution yeah. at this point the in France. The closest thing we've had in, in the developed West, certainly. Oh, for uh, sure. Yeah, the one thing, the, 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 that, that alliance between the militant students and the working class, the thing that was... Been that throughout that decade was searched for in the U.S. and elsewhere, and didn't come close to being realized. It was only there in that moment. Yeah, and it was uh, it was a beautiful moment. But um, the French Communist Party, the Stalinist Party, uh, did not like the way that things were going. They were, you know, much more happy doing these piecemeal reforms and towing the Moscow line. You don't want to go to that. You're scared you don't of these. Go to that that abyss. You don't know. You don't know where you're going to end up you at the end know. of that reshuffling. You, you've got a nice office. Exactly. You've got a uh, Renault car. You yeah. Know, who who needs a revolution? Things yeah. are going good. They sit on uh, the Communist Party sits on its hands uh, because it's the new left and there's not really any sort of idea of what state, taking state power would look like. Uh, you know the re, the the general strike and the insurrection kind of peters out. However. What we think of today, what we know of the French state as this extremely generous, uh, progressive welfare state with, uh, what is it, fucking eight weeks of vacation yeah. every year, a uh, 54-hour work week, um, you know, all sorts of social provisions, health care, and this, that, and the other thing. This comes directly out of buying off the working class yep. of France in 1968. Yep. De Gaulle comes back. They bring him back, and he raises the minimum wage 50%. <laughs> he, makes, he makes a 40-hour work week from a 44-hour work week. He just basically gives away the store just to put down this fucking insurrection. Mm-hmm. Now, imagine, imagine, imagine you're Jean Respal. All right, you're like a fascist sympathizer. You still think that monarchy is a really good idea. You are an ultra Catholic. There are kids. Not only are they fucking putting up barricades in the streets of Paris, but they're fucking and they're doing drugs. Now, what do you think in your Grenouille fucking head? Like, how do you take this? You must think the world's fucking ending. Yeah, and he clearly did because it was only <laughs> a f- four years later that he published a book saying this is the end result of all of your ideals. Yes. Is you're going to open the door to uh, just this ravening horde. The book opens. Uh, uh, it's a flash forward kind of because it starts with the, the, these, these boats having come aground and, and, all, and all of the, the refugees pouring on yes. the, the, the and, and people fleeing the coast. They're, they're replacing greatly as a yeah. great replacement. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's a, there's this one lone French literature professor. <laughs> Total prick. <laughs> staying in his home in resistance to the tide. Uh, and, he, and a young student comes up to him. <laughs> And he says, this is great. They're going to destroy France. He's got I, long, stringy hair. He's wearing, like, you yeah. know, all sorts of hippie garb. Yeah. And, he, yeah. he, is, he is the most perfect straw figure because he explicitly says, he says, I hate France. I want it to go away. <laughs> I, I, these, yeah, these are a bunch of savages. He's like, gonna, France is racist. Yeah. It's misogynistic. Yeah. You know, we just want free love and we want socialism. Yeah. And it's we like, wanna... we're just going to take all your stuff. We yeah. don't care. Right. It's, it's like a Ben Garrison cartoon character. <laughs> yes, exactly. And uh, uh, the French literature professor, he gives him a big speech about the <laughs> the uh, inheritance that he's throwing away and he lists a bunch of battles from <laughs> tours to lapanto in, in and, ponderous yeah. stilted prose yeah. and then he blows him away with a shotgun <laughs> just, just boom right in the fucking head headshot boom and that is it. really his answer to the 68 uh, rebellion it really is and like it, only in that context can you really understand camp of the saints because this this sense that raspel has that like the west has given up on itself all right yes Okay, your your West, your France has given up on itself, right? But that those students and those workers, right, and and the and the and the kind of um, not subversion, but the 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 hegemony of these leftist ideas coming out of '68 for much of the population, he's only think he's pushing that forward into time, and he's saying that '68, we're not going to have some sort of neoliberal pushback to that, right? '68 and all the freedoms that it opened, that is going to be the decay. That is the track that we are on. This is why the white race is going to fall apart because ultimately, and this again ties back into those very, very same French revolutionary Republican ideals, right, is that 
these people, these hippies, these leftists, these cultural Marxist conceptions of rights are no longer national rights or rights just for white people or rights for French people. They are taking these and making them truly universal, right? They are saying they are welcoming the Ganges as their brothers and sisters yeah. as they arrive. It is the ultimate fear because for these right-wing reactionaries, it is actually these hundreds-year-old ideals put into action if you were to really take them seriously. Yeah. Because why would the nation-state be the bounds for these conceptions of freedom and justice? And the the power of the work, and it's the same thing with any of these reactionary screeds, is, is that there is always going to be one thing that resonates, uh, and the thing that resonates, and this is true to this moment, to the to this, this day of every, every every person who's part of this this uh, surging uh, neo fascism, is is that they correctly identify that liberal liberal Western culture is hollow. Yes, it, it. I mean, they are correct in that they have replaced God and the church and the nation with nothing. Right. And they see that, and they say the end result of this will be dissolution and suicide. Yes, and they are not necessarily wrong on that. No, point. Be- because they are, because they because Western liberal s- society is absolutely hollow and empty. There is nothing anyone is supposed to fight for. There's nothing anyone's supposed to believe in besides, you know, one's petty amusements uh, and and flattering oneself with one's, you know, percept what one's. Uh, I, I, like narcissistic belief system, like right. you believe things, and and that's that's what Respel and a lot of these guys point to is that for liberals, like these these beliefs, they 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 they're so ostentatiously held, but they're very 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 thinly held. They're really just for the consumption of others, the virtue signaling, virtue the words signal, they love yeah, to use, yeah, yeah. and they're not wrong about any of that. What they're wrong about is that there is an alternative to all of this. Yes, there is a vision that can replace. We've dethroned God, and it was replaced with the nation. That's like a slightly less abstract version. And then there's the fucking human race right. that we can replace the nation with yeah. as a thing that persists before us and will persist after us and our children's children. And our role, our 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 like life task of making that that uh, making that future, like that is that is a project that is as as as. Uh, as dynamic and as uh, something that can uh, mobilize and 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 spark imagination, belief, and, and passion, as any of these things that the, that the that the reactionaries pine for, but does not have the, the 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 flip side of of cherishing and and turning a virtue into cruelty and and mass death and 18th century arm wars. All right, because that guy does <laughs> caress his great grandfather's, you know, Louis the whatever. Oh God, arm war. The fetishize that like that those guy. old shit. It's like, come on, you don't but, actually like any of that. You like anime. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> so yeah, I mean. <laughs> Like pregnant within the the Declaration of the Rights of Man that comes out of the Re- out of the French Revolution, right? It, are these Enlightenment principles we've been talking about? Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, this, that, and the other, right? But there are other Enlightenment thinkers too who are of the same sort of mindset. They had the same sense that there are no God given rules, right? Mm-hmm. And that you know human beings create history, but not in conditions of their own choosing. That we are a social being, uh, we are social beings, and that we are uh, ultimately like collectivity, whether that stops in the village or in the province or the nation state or even globally, right? Those are the people like Rousseau, who Steven Pinker hates. He calls him a cuckoo. <laughs> so there's the Rousseau, right, with the sense of the uh, uh, general will, you know, and the kind of tabula rasa human being. And then, of course, there's the Proudhons and there is the uh, Blanquis and there are the Marxes and there are the so on and so forth. You know, Marx works in the same tradition as these uh, earlier thinkers had, right? And all he does, I believe, are, is take these principles to their logical conclusion, which is that if it is true that human beings must have a social compact and must have rights, you know, within the political sphere and in terms of things like property and protection, all right, that those should extend even farther, that ultimately it is a positive and progressive thing to have this bourgeois nationalism and this new mode of production, but that ultimately if you want to keep true even to Right. The basics of, of what of that enlightenment thought that it must be generalized. It must be universalized. And this is why Raspal, who never these right wingers who never even wanted this thing to begin with, would think that it was absolutely fucking horrific. Whereas when I look at this story and I, and I read it and it was fucking disgusting, there was rape 
horribly uh, fucking um, racist and um, dehumanizing uh, scenes and scenarios and descriptions of people. Um, a real just looking down on um, all these like kids who just fuck and, and do drugs and have a really great time and uh, then hates the media. It's a kind of cultural Marxist sort of thing. Oh, yeah. But, you know, when I look at when those immigrants land, those migrants land in that boat, you know. A gen- like a, a bunch of strikes uh, break out through France as the immigrants arrive. Um, the prisons are opened up and everybody is let free. Uh, the workplace is taken over. The French government falls and eventually all these Western governments fall in Respal's novel because ultimately the nationalism and, uh, you know, of, of France uh, and, and the other Western powers cannot take this overcoming of it by this kind of international invasion, this sort of uh, coming together of the Ganges and the Loire Valley, right? And um, Raspel sees that as horrible and brutal because, as we've pointed out, in every single description of a black or brown person in his book, they're not human. Yeah. They are literally, they're like this, you know, this, this aggregated, mindless zombie horde of like, raping conniving uh destructive uh, just brown hordes yeah. now since we know that that is not true and that all human beings have essentially the same desires for life you know like shelter and food and we're social beings and we know that brown and black people are monsters right yeah if we take if we take that out of the equation my you know, my takeaway from this is what if Camp of Saints, but like unfascistically? Yeah, it's a beautiful fucking vision. <laughs> well, yeah, because because like the thing that has to re- that has to replace the absolutely hollow death worshiping liberalism that is suicidal, because what else is it going to do? It's it's the end of history. It's it's Nietzsche's last man. You and know, we are in the process of sting- um, species wide extinction. Exactly. Which is suicide. And, <laughs> and, and, and because what else could it be? Because in a world where you've alienated all of social elements to the market you are no you don't have an, an existence you aren't a, a being with any sort of uh, a texture or richness to your life you are you are a marionette and we all are to some degree or another caught in that and of course it's going to want to kill itself because it is dead already uh, uh but like an internationalist leftism that says like the project of humanity is to extend you know basic uh uh, uh existence to everyone and to build a world where we're all involved and engaged and and uh crucially like autonomous yeah and building it because if you if you, you if you abolish the market you have to someone has th- these decisions still have to be made and they're made instead of by this uh abstracted fantasy of a market by us then your life has meaning and autonomy in right. a way that it can't in the current situation. As they say, it's, uh, we, we leave prehistory and history truly begins, a history where we actually create ourselves and our future collectively and together. Exactly. Now, you and I were on that page, and probably most of the people who are listening to this are on that page, especially the people who are probably listening on the uh, Black Wolves feed who are pirating <laughs> that. Those fuckers. <laughs> God they, bless you. You know, I, I'm very glad that you're listening, but, uh, you know, Enjoy it. It's behind the wall. And uh, just think maybe, you know, since I'm a construction worker, uh, Andy is a, uh, you know, bike messenger. And uh, Jamie is uh, Jamie works day in and day out in Sam Cedar's uh, majority report mines. You know, you could throw like two or five dollars a month uh, our way. Right. But our listeners, I think, understand, you know, this this point we're trying to make about taking these enlightenment ideals seriously and also about how. Like if 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 the twentieth century has proven anything, it's that like nationalism is a dead end. Yeah. Not just for the working class, but ultimately for humanity in general. Because as we can see now, you don't have a supranational body. The UN's not doing it. Mm-mm. No, there's the Paris Accords. There's there's no international body out there that's able to uh, mediate the different interests of capitalist nations in order to save this fucking planet. But to kind of round things out and, and to conclude, like, unfortunately, while we might all know that, um, again, you know, 500,000 copies of this book coming out, this kind of blood and soil conception of uh, French civilization, uh, this xenophobia, this racism of getting rid of the other, of white genocide, right? Of like, what will France be if we let these foreigners into our mix? It's not like the Normans who we let, you know, have yeah. all of Normandy because yeah. they were white and wait, they might have been pagan, but, you know, they became Christian, so this, it was fine, right? Um, unfortunately for us, uh, it, it seems like this right wing, especially with uh, Marine Le Pen uh, in France, is coming bl- back in blood and soil 
bizarrely is 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 like the the, the the new vision for the future for a lot of French people, uh, including working class people. So, well, that's why the the Yellow Jackets movement is so uh, pregnant with possibility. It's 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 terrifying, but also kind of the only hopeful thing I've honestly seen because you could watch after they elected Macron, who fancied himself another one of these synthetic figures, Ugh. another another man. If, if Napoleon was history on horseback. Uh, Macron was history on a Segway. <laughs> uh, this technocrat who is going to who is going to bind the nation. An eye wounds. banker crusading right. across because here. you had a situation where the main parties were discredited. The the, the socialist party was a joke, uh, yep. the, but the but no one had any faith in in you know the more abundant corrupt uh, national sort of right wing party. And he came in to sort of as the as the third party figure to right. resolve the differences. And you could see that when it happened, just think this is going to end in disaster because it's just going to be a furtherance of this unsustainable neoliberal moment. He is a placeholder. Yes. And seeing people mobilize to oppose him is incredibly encouraging because otherwise they were just going to sleepwalk into neo-fascism yeah and it's like it might still happen now the the yellow jackets who knows they might end up being the spear point for that but they might not i mean have you seen there's videos of red left and right wing yellow jackets fighting in the streets of, of paris yes yeah so like this this movement is all of the un you know all of the energy coming forward all of the all of the ang- all of the anger all of the resentment all of the basic uh disenchantment with the the order and it the, the the lack of leadership is terrifying, but also inevitable given like the the absolutely fallow state of the left in the West that we've talked about a lot since the end of the the Cold War. Uh, but like it's still happening, and what comes out of it could it's either going to be the rough beast slouching towards Bethlehem, or it's going to be the baby Jesus. Who knows? I mean, uh, that one is really up in the air. I'm not on the ground. I can't understand yeah, me that either, myself. Huh? But but is it it is incredible this uh, if if we want to be nationalist french national nationalistic about anything let's say that there might be something in the french character that knows how to throw the fuck down put some barricades together and uh, they'll, fucking, Molotov they'll fight <laughs> the thing is is that like for the average french person of, of 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 middle or lower middle income like they are much better off than uh, americans of that same oh strength. sure yeah and yet with this situation they're throwing hands with cops Meanwhile, people in far worse conditions, people who have to wait in a fucking parking lot for like a free health care, you know, for hours, they're going to like put a fucking Blue Lives Matter sticker on the back of their car and they're, they're going to thank uh, cops for their service. They're not going to fucking deck them. Right. And that is that is the French. That is the revolutionary uh, for good or ill. That is the revolutionary bequeathment is Indeed. that they're they're, they're, they're not going to put up with what we would put up with right and i i think maybe just to put one final um historical materialist uh point on this is it seems like if you if we look at the kind of large abstract history that we we went through hundreds of years of it and a lot of it is tied to modes of production and various regimes of capital accumulation tied into state formation and the way in which the people and the state you know uh come together and the state is envisioned whether that's a, this right wing or this left wing formation it seems like especially in this third republic period or certainly you know in the the 30 glorious years of de gaulle when uh you know france's economy was really booming and french nationalism was uh t- you know uh not fascist and also not communist right yeah. but somewhere in between it seems like nationalism and national development are tied and together. And it seems like for a certain period of maybe 150, 200 years, uh, th- those two things were um, connected in such a way that it was a progressive force. Yeah. You've had two major attempts, I think, to try to have something that goes beyond the nation state. The first being the United Nations, which I think was a farce from the beginning. Um, it was, you know, with the Security Council. Yeah, the Security it Council just, made it a joke to it, it, get yeah. Trump. It, it was. It, was it could never, never have been debate. anything other than just an administrative, you know, el- uh, like the Western imperial powers, you know, administering their their spheres of influence. Right. Well, the, the other hundred and seventy something countries get to like, um, you know, yell and scream yeah. as they're fucking drowned in the ocean. Uh, and then the other one, of course, the the European Union. And I think that's a question out there that that I don't have any strong answers for, but it is a. Um, 
you know, it is an attempt to, to rise above the nation state. I think the, the real debate for us on the left right now is whether we take the Giannis Varoufakis view, which is that the EU is what we've got. It's what Le Pen is fighting against to try to break away from Golden Dawn hates, yeah. uh, you know, the Brexiters hate, right? Yeah. It might be a completely imperfect, it might even be a completely bourgeois international institution, but we need to storm those heavens and try to make a united Europe, you know, something more progressive moving forward, right? Mm-hmm. Then there are those of us, and I think I, I fall on this line, is that the the European Union, just like the UN before it, um, was a failure from the get. Yeah. Uh, because it was just so imbued with, um, you know, uh, it might have been super nat- national, but uh, it was basically a trade uh, market. It yeah. was a negotiator. It was a neoliberal fucking. It was. Uh, it was always. It always existed uh, in the context of maintaining, of creating a capital market in the European. It started area. as the European Coal and Steel Commission. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it exists to facilitate capitalist trade in yes. Europe, and that's it. And that's what the euro was about. It's what the whole thing was about, and we've seen it being used to discipline you know wayward uh countries and uh it, it it i mean i don't know like i i honestly think the question of taking it over versus you know destroying it that's a tactical issue yeah, i mean i think fair. and i i don't know the answer to that because i'm not close enough to i it, wouldn't but, go hard in, in any yeah, direction myself. but i mean it's historical role is pretty in my opinion unarguable it, it, it was a, it's an element of of the emerging uh uh, corporate capitalism that was transcending the nation state. Exactly. Uh, yes. one, once, yeah. once they got out of Bretton Woods, and you know, <laughs> once they started floating the dollar, uh, you're creating a international capitalism. Right. That does no longer, you know, the, as uh, Ned Beatty said in, in Network, you know, no nations, no people. There's the uh, holistic system of systems. Or as I and, said on Houston Street before, no nations, no border. Yeah. Fuck, law and, and, order. and the EU <laughs> existed just as a way to manage that new reality right. of, of, of like corporate personhood transcending national borders yes and also uh, uh like international bourgeois cooperation like not just uh uh one-to-one but like but create a network of market relations that was you know uh, cross-border that, that you have a customs barrier and i think the maybe the most progressive and i think for us uh the the most positive thing but for the raspels of the world the most frightening thing is the free movement of peoples right mm-hmm. and that um is really what it seems like um the working class supporters of the right wing um seem to hate the most yeah. is that competition in labor but i mean that's 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 the challenge because it's it's like pulling a it's like doing the thing where you pull the uh the tablecloth while leaving all of the stemware from falling over i could never do that yeah no no yeah <laughs> Peter Venkman, the flowers are still standing, <laughs> is that, you know, we have to transcend the nation state and we have to create international institutions and we have to create, uh, like, free movement of people so that you're not a slave to, you know, your birth in terms of your economic outcome. Maybe unions that transcend right. borders. Right, yeah. but you can't do that in a context where national working classes are being immiserated steadily because yeah. they're going to put two and two together. It might make up five but to them, it's going to make sense because they're going to see people coming in, and this happens here too. And this is a big, big reason of the, the working class support for Trump. Even if they, even if it's not true, even if you can, you could put fifteen charts to show actually, you know, immigrant employment does not affect. It doesn't change That's, the. Yeah. It doesn't change your sense that my life has gotten worse, and there's right. more of them here. Right. And that is a thing that is concrete and in your face, and that you can make a spurious but not unjustifiable jump to say that is. That's what needs to stop, because the only alternative is people like the Clintonian neoliberals saying, no, it's fine. You just need retraining, you know, right. like uh, all miners in the code. It's like folks, that's yeah. all like if that's the only alternative to someone saying build a wall or get rid of the EU, then, of course, people are going to yeah. pick that. Yeah, it's a Faust. Uh, there's there's no choice there. And, and the last the last thing I'll say on this is. I think it's great what folks in the DSA are doing. I think when you see AOC out there, like, grilling some pharma fucking monster or, like, um, tweeting a storm and owning fucking neoliberals and fucking conservatives and putting forward a Green New Deal, I think these are all positive things, at least in the short term, right? We're seeing some real movement for the first time in my entire life in something that looks like a program. Yeah. It's, I'm cautiously optimistic about it. I will only say that in the light of all of what we've seen about what 
what happens when you bound a system and an ideology and a economic system and a welfare system within the bonds of one nation state. It doesn't look good. It's not, it's good. not good, folks. It's not good, folks. You hate to see it because even the best social, like national social democracy that we can imagine, we still need to be working at the same time to transcend that nationalism that is so old now that may have served its purpose in the past, but now just seems completely more and more like it is an anachronism and try to think about what it would be to have inst- international institutions maybe at the same time as you're trying to have a Green New Deal. Ah. No, I, I agree. And I think, honestly, I feel like that stuff, the, the, the movement you're talking about, it's a necessary precondition. Uh, yes. Like, I, I, I honestly don't think this is this. Uh, you can't skip the steps. It's not going to make things say. worse. It's not going to make things sure. worse. Yeah. It's not going to reify. I, I don't think it's going to reify, like, Nazism or any of that shit. But I, honestly, it, like, we've talked about this, about how, like, the, the problem for the left is just a lack of people who, under, who are aware of the even ideas and the alternatives and the concepts. And but these are people who also, you know, uh evaluate politics in a national context and so they're going to respond to national political figures and national arguments and it's step one and yes it must be followed if it's if it's by itself yeah you're going to end up in the same place we talked about last week yep last time but i feel like it is a necessary first step because you have to get people even thinking in those possibilities even imagine themselves as a class for itself even if it's within the nation exactly and i feel like that's the question that's open it's it's the same thing with the the yellow jackets it's like there is this moment of possibility as people are becoming radically disenchanted and are being met with people who are opposed to the current system mm. and are not either just trying to mindlessly keep it propped up or cynically exploit it for right wing reasons. Uh, and but it's so early. Yeah. And yeah. we'll see what happens. And yet it's so late, too. That's what's we, terrifying. That's, that's the, the scary thing. Moment. It's like, uh, <laughs> ooh, ooh, man, for the for the folks uh who who listened to our um, our long uh, dissertation on uh, Camp of the Saints? Thank you so much. You are among those people that Matt talked about who understand these concepts. So perhaps you can I don't know weaponize this history that we've created yeah. for you and uh, use it to maybe imagine how we can get out of this never ending loop of uh, I don't know right wing to left wing nationalism, yeah. internationalism, and then and and fascism, then, yeah, and, 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 all and, that and syncretizing it, and then recontextualizing it, and moving it forward, and until the seas swallow us all. <laughs> exactly.